Uh, if you would turn to First Peter, First uh, Peter. A week from this Sunday, we'll have uh, pumpkin pumpkin Sunday. What happens on pumpkin Sunday? You might know. What? Kids get a pumpkin. What, a, what does everybody get? Yeah. Pumpkin pie. We have pumpkin pie that day for everybody. A slice of that, and uh, have a little Cool Whip or something to go on top. And uh, how many of you like it? Cool Whip without Cool Whip. Uh, a couple of you. Okay, a few of you. Yeah, I've got to have Cool Whip for me. So, First Peter chapter four, and um, so uh, verse number one. The the principle tonight. And it's been a little while since we've been here with this. And so we're finding, uh, am, I, am I on? I'm not on. I'm not on. I'm on. Oh, the speakers are not on. Okay, there we go. We're good now. <clears throat> Just kind of remind you of the whole scheme of this thing. Um, we go to God's Word, and uh, you can probably cut all that other stuff out of there, I'm sure, us trying to find the speakers and everything. Uh, but we go to the Word of God, and we're trying to find these foundational truths, and God's Word is truth. We're not just looking for the truth. We're looking in the truth. The Word of God is the truth. And so as we're going through the Bible, we're looking for the truths, the principles, the foundational things these eternal principles that God gives us. And as we're identifying those things, um, like the Ten Commandments, that'd be, those would be eternal truths, foundational truths, uh, principles for us to live by. And so as we, <coughs> as we recognize those things and identify those things, we come to this again, we're looking for what is my commitment to that? What, what am I to do with that? How am I to use that? How am I to apply it to my life? And sometimes that's, that's easy to find. You know, thou shalt not kill. My commitment to that is I'm not going to kill. So I've made it mine. I've, I've, thou shalt not steal. I'm not going to steal. Uh, not to bear false witness. I'm not going to bear false witness. And so I make that my own thing, uh, I, my commitment to it. And then we come to this third thing is this this thought of this standard or these guardrails or these things that will keep us heading towards that. What am I going to do to keep me living the way I ought to live? What's going, what am I going to do to put it, something in place that's going to keep me on track? Um, and so if, uh, let's say I'm a thief, and um, we do have um, those... Notes are inside those bulletin covers there. Um, let's, if I'm a thief, I, I read to God's word, and I say, thou shalt not steal, and I make the commitment. I said, I'm not going to steal. What would I put in my life? Let's, let's take just a moment here to do this. What would I put in my life to keep me from being a thief? Don't come out. What would you say? Accountability would be one thing. You're in touch with somebody. Yes, ma'am. Praying. Praying is a good one. I like that. I like the way you're thinking there, young lady. Yes, sir. Commitment. There's, there's something in the book of Ephesians that helps us with this. Those that stole, steal no more, and work. Work. You're to work, and then you... As you're working, you're supplying your own need the right way, and then you are to learn to give. And so there's some things there. Those are things I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray. I'm going to be committed. I'm going to, what else did somebody else said? Um, uh, accountability. Uh, I'm going to get a job. And I'm going I'm to learn to give. Those are things. So those would be standards in my life. Uh, maybe you've been running with a pack of thieves. And so I'm going to cut those out. I'm going to make a decision not to run with those same people. Uh, I was listening to uh, Dave Ramsey yesterday or the day before. They had one of those hours where only millionaires get to call in. 
And uh, so that's always interesting to me, that, that, that hour that they do that. And people call in, uh, what's your net worth? Uh, my net worth is $1.2 million or $1.8 million or whatever it is. They were talking to a lady. She's 45 years old. And uh, he walks them through this, and where they got it. What, did, they, did you get anything from an inheritance? And, and a lot of times they say no. He wants to know, did they go to school, what their GPA was, and all those kinds of things like that, how it's distributed. And he, he was asking them this day, what is some of the stupid, what's the stupidest thing you ever did? And what's the smartest thing you ever did with money? The lady talked about something about she did stupid, a, a silly thing. And she said, one of the smartest things I did, she said, I started keeping different company. I thought, well, I kind of leaned into that. It was curious to me. She said, she said, I was running around with people that had kind of a, uh, the wrong kind of mindset that was leading me down a path fi a financial ruin and she said i i stayed away from those kinds of people and so tonight we're looking at this principle the, the principle of light and darkness the principle of light and darkness and so we're looking here in first peter chapter 4 verse number one it says for as much then as christ hath suffered for us in the flesh arm yourselves likewise with the same mind for he hath he that hath suffered in the flesh hath, hath ceased from sin that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but the, to the will of God. For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness, lust, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries, wherein they think it strange that ye run not with them to the same excess of rioting, speaking evil of you who shall give an account to him that is ready to judge the quick of the dead." There is this thought that you're, as your life has been given to Christ and, and uh, you have cut sin out of your life and you're not doing these things that you used to do. That In verse number 4, it says they're going to think it's strange that you don't run with them. We talk about this sometimes. We use that vernacular. We use that kind of phraseology. We said, who are you running with? Who's your running buddies? And they think it's strange that you don't run to the same excess of rioting. And they're going to speak evil of you. And God gives us many, many verses about this thing of light and darkness. That once we were the children of, of darkness, the children of disobedience, and now He's called us out of the darkness into the light, and now we're children of the light. And so there's a, a great distinction between light and darkness. There's some things in life that don't mix. Oil and water don't mix. They, they separate. Uh, when you think about the poles of a magnet, they, they actually repel each other. When you think about light and darkness, they don't exist in the same place. It has to do with the laws of nature, the laws of physics. And, and so um, there was a scientist at uh, Texas A&M uh, reading a little thing about this, that they did a, a study that in absolute darkness, that they determined that a single candle could be seen from a mile and a half away. That single candle really stood out in the darkness. And you know what? We're living in a world of darkness. And we're to be light. We're called to be light. We're called to be salt in this world. And as the world gets darker, we moan about how dark it gets. But you know, our light can be very clearly seen if we're living the light that God's called us to. Now turn to 1 John, if you would. 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1. And we're going to begin in verse number 5. It says here, This then is the message which we have heard of Him, and declare unto you that God is light, God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with Him and, we, and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ and His Son cleanseth us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make Him a liar, and His word is not in us. There's a great uh, truth to work on. You could use it in your home and in any relationship you have. In verse number 6, it says, if <clears throat> I'm sorry, verse number 7, it says, but if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. If you're walking in the light and I am walking in the light, we will be able to fellowship one with another. 
God has called us to walk in the light. And what happens is that, let's say, let's say Brother Howard and I are not getting along. No doubt he's not walking in the light because, of course, I am. And so, but the sad truth of, it, of this thing is that oftentimes we're trying to decide who is not walking in the light. And sometimes both of us may not be walking in the light. And then both of us need to get right. And both of us would come to the place where we're walking in the light. We would have fellowship one with another. And so what's going to fix a home? Us to walk in the light. What's going to help us to be a better friend to our neighbor? Walk in the light. And so he's calling us to this. This Christian life is a Christ-centered life. A Christ-centered life. A worldly life or a carnal life or a life lived apart from Christ, that is a very self-centered life. So you have a Christocentric, Christ-centered life. And then this other life that you have, that oftentimes we're leading, me included, I'm living a very man-centered life. What is the difference between a Christ-centered life and a man-centered life? How's that look? How's, how, what's a Christ-centered life look like? Selfless. Selfless. Evident in your life? Yes, ma'am. Yes, you would be you'd be a same person. I was hoping she'd say pray. You're praying a person. You're a praying person. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're you're turned towards him. Okay. What would the man-centered life be like? Self-centered. Prideful. It's what I can get from me. So, so if we could, if we figure out what a Christ-centered life looks like, the man-centered life is like the opposite of that. Living for, living for Christ, living for yourself, for your own needs, whatever you're trying to get. And so it says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 4 through 8, it says, Ye are all the children of light and the children of, of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others, as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us, who are of the day, be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. He's, Paul's talking to these Thessalonian people. He said, if, if you're going to be a child of the light, a, a child of the day, a child of the Lord, you're going to live your life differently, sober, aware of what's going on. You're not going to walk, walk this world sleepwalking. You're not going to be a uh, change of the darkness. He said, you're going to be very different. And so we have very different opposing, va- a, a very opposed value system uh, that come into conflict. The Christian life lives the life for eternal things. The man center, the worldly life, is living for the temporal, for the here and now. Can't look beyond, can't look forward. The, the Christian life uh, uh, lives a life that dies to the flesh. Uh, the, the, the here and now life, the man center life, is feeding the flesh, whatever I can get for myself. It says in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, it says, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but now are the people of God, which had not attained mercy, but now have attained mercy. God, when he, when he saved your soul, he called you out of darkness, and it says that he called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You got mercy. You, you became a pe- the people of God. You say, but preacher, there's darkness all around us. What, how am I to live my life in light when there's darkness all around me? Turn, turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter, chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. <clears throat> there's there's a, a deliberateness and a very intentional way you're going to have to learn to live your life. You're going to have to decide on a daily basis to separate yourself from things that would drag you down, drag you back into the darkness. I know most of you, most of you could say uh, that Christ has saved my soul. 
I've walked out of the darkness. I've walked into the light. I'm a child of day. I'm no longer a child of the night. But you know, sometimes we get pulled back, don't we? The Bible talks about backsliding. The Bible talks about uh, us having a, a, a stiff neck and, and we're, we're rebellious people sometimes. And so uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse number 14, we need to give ourselves every advantage to live the life that God's called us to live. And so it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14, it says, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God has said. I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their people, and they, uh, they, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. And so the Word of God is talking about a different value system. Where He says, what communion, what fellowship, how are you going to yoke up with things that, that are opposed or opposite or, or darkness and we're trying to be in the light. And you know, there are a lot of philosophies in the world that, that pull and push against uh, Christ and a, a Christ-centered life. Uh, uh, one of those things would be humanism. Humanism is all about man. It's all about what we can get. It's all about elevating man above God. And, and it is really, in a sense, it is a, a worship of mankind. It is a, it is a belief system uh, that is, it has its own kind of faith, I guess. And so uh, humanism is a secular, man-centered philosophy at war with God. And all biblical values... It rejects supernatural influences. It, it, it says that it stresses this self-fulfillment or man's happiness or man's pleasure is elevated above everything. Man, we seem to be living in a great time of that day. Not just humanism, there's all kinds of ism. There's hedonism, which is a philosophy that man lives primarily, primarily for comfort and pleasure. It's all about me. I, I'm, I need to be happy. I deserve to be happy. I deserve to get whatever I can get. There's materialism, and you kind of understand what that is. Uh, it's a spirit of covetousness that wants to pile up a big mound of stuff. Uh, the bigger my mound of stuff, the happier I'll be. But boy, we see it played out in the lives of people that have lots of things. Oftentimes, those things do not make them happy. It doesn't, it doesn't buy them freedom. It buys them bondage. Naturalism, it's a philosophy that the physical world can only is the only reality. There is no supernatural. And the only truth or the true test of truth is what man's mind can think up, what, what man can investigate. And all these different isms that are against God. <coughs> Second Peter chapter 2, verse 1 says this. It says, but there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false, pro false teachers among you who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that brought them, and bring unto themselves swift destruction. You know, people walk in, and uh, our universities are full of people that are teaching these kind of things, that God is not alive, God, there's never been a God, don't, don't you worry about God, God is... God is been relegated, uh, religion is a crutch for the weak-minded, and he said, I'm going to teach you, or she's going to teach you how to, how to worship man. Man is the highest being on the planet, and, and man deserves uh, the place that he has. And, and so what is that? That's a, that's a heresy because there is a God that deserves to be worshipped. And oftentimes Christians, maybe not in word, but in the way they live their life, they live a life that pulls them back into darkness. They live in these philosophies trying to get their, get their mountain of stuff or they're trying to live as if there is no God. It says in Jude, verse number 4, it says, For there are certain men crept in unawares. It says, Who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. This constant whisper, the constant whisper going on. There is no God. There is no God. There is no God. You don't need religion. You don't need the Bible. You don't need all that. You make your rules up. You're God to yourself. You choose. Boy, we're, sometimes we hear that 
There have been times in my life that I didn't live for the Lord. And I don't know that I bought all the way into it. I bought into it enough that it changed the way I lived. I lived without God. And I wasn't into certain things, but I was living this way. I was living an ungodly, godless life. I had no place for Him. And so that darkness crept back into my life. And there was very little light. In this passage of Scripture in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, he starts the verse I started with, says, Be not unequally yoked. Now that, that's, a, that's a word, yoked. Is, that's something we're not as familiar with as we used to be. A yoke is a wooden device that you could put animals in that you would pair them up or link these animals up together and they would, they would pull a, a heavy load. Uh, they'd pull in tandem something that they couldn't maybe pull alone. And so you'd yoke up maybe two, two uh, cows or two oxen or two horses and you'd put them in a yoke and you're trying to pair them in a, such a way that they're the same size, the same kind of animal even, uh, the same strength, uh, maybe even the same kind of temperament. You, you, you hook up a couple donkeys together maybe and uh, they're temperamental animals. And, and uh, Bud of ours uh, over in Bean Blossom, he had, he had two old mules he'd, he'd hook up and Sometimes he'd, when he hosts the preacher's meeting, he'd, he'd hook him up and take us rides around his property there. The uh, only time I've ever been led around by a, a bunch of mules on somebody's property was over his place, and he loved those old mules. But you know what God says here? He said, don't but be unequally yoked. You ought to be yoked with the same, yoked with light, not with darkness. And that mismatch, if you have a mismatch yoking with animals, you say you yoke one kind of animal with another or a different size or a different strength or a different temperament, it, you're not going to get the, it's not going to be effective. Uh, you're not going to get the job done. They're not going to be compatible. Matter of fact, it's going to lead maybe to, it's going to be almost like cruelty that one's pulling, the other's not. And it's going to be very frustrating. And, you know, you see this sometimes where God's people yoke up or link up or they paired up with somebody they ought not to pair up with and they're incompatible, incompatible in a spiritual realm. It says in Matthew 18, verse 20, we use this verse for, for prayer oftentimes. It says, For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. The reason why we can link up and, and join ourselves together like that because we're because He is in the midst. We have a spiritual connection there. He says in this passage of Scripture, He says, Righteous people go have a hard time with unrighteousness. Light's going to have a hard time with darkness. It says Christ can't, can't have concord or fellowship or agreement with Belial. That's a word for Satan. Can't put him in the same yoke. He says you can't have the temple of God and the temple of idols. It's not the same thing. And so sometimes we see this frustration, this ineffectiveness, that's, that's probably the least of the problems of that. But some of the great problems of that is that when we link up with people at the worst side of it, there's a corrupting influence. There's a pulling down or pulling us back into a life that we got free of. Isn't there incredible power in influence? People can influence you. They can, they can leave a mark on you. Some people have more influence on you than other people. Some people, they said something to you. It wouldn't make a big deal to you. It wouldn't matter to you. But if someone said that has power over you, that just have incredible influence, what they say, wow. Somebody would say something about maybe the way you look. Hey, I don't like the way you look today. Some people say, Phew, don't matter. I don't care what you think. Somebody says, I don't like the way you look today. Man, it would be like a blow to you. It hurt. It'd matter. My grandma had a way of saying things. She was very blunt. Putting on some weight, aren't you? <laughs> She'd stick you with that. Sometimes she'd say it right to your face. Yeah. Influence. Influence. And I know what we say. We say, well, I'm going to influence them. Sometimes we do. Sometimes we do. Sometimes they influence us. You, you see this happen. Oftentimes, don't you, where young people will do things in a crowd that they would never do alone. It's the power of influence. 
somebody that has been walking in the light, they've walked back into a company of people that have some darkness there and pulls that person of light into the darkness. It says in Psalm 1, it says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. And if you've ever studied that, there's a progression there. But his, his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be plant, like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bring forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Here's a man that's decided, I'm going to cut out the darkness in my life. I'm living in a world with darkness all around me. And there are some things we can't escape, obviously. But he says, I'm not going to walk with the ungodly. I'm not going to stand in the way of sinners. I'm not going to sit in the seat of the scornful. He says, therefore, he has delight in the law of the Lord. But, he says in verse 4, the ungodly are not so. They're not so. They company with like. They company with those that are having the same problems, the same bondage, the same, the same addictions, the same sins. And they wallow in that. God help us, we ought to be delivered from some of that. And we ought to try to pull them out of it. We ought to try to be effective in that way. Let me give you, a, it says in <clears throat> Proverbs 9, 6, it says, forsake the foolish and live. Now, forsake the foolish doesn't mean that you cut them off, doesn't mean that you're unkind to them, doesn't mean that you don't offer a, a, a lifesaver to them in a sense that you're trying to pull them out of the, the muck and the mire of the world. It doesn't mean that. But you forsake the foolish, foolish in the sense that you cut that out of your life and get away from that and you're going to live. It says, and go in the way of understanding. I think you probably have these in your notes, these, these statements here. The first one is casual relationships with unbelievers are unavoidable. You cannot, you cannot escape being around unbelievers. You can't. There are people that try. Isolation is not our goal. Climbing up on some mountain and trying to build a commune big enough for us and the walls high enough, that, that is not going to work. Because you've got to go to the store and you've got to interact with people and you've got to work with people and some of them are unbelievers. And I've, I've had friendships of sorts with unbelievers. And these relationships are key opportunities to share the gospel and for you to try to help them. And so uh, we're, the, the thing is, is we're not trying to seek to blend with the world, though. I'm not trying to mesh my life up with them. I've got to interact with them. I may work with them. They, they're my neighbors. They, they're my acquaintances. I, I, I'm going to be friendly to them. But in a real sense, I can't have friendship with them because it's different. We don't interact. On my purposes and my eternal soul, is go we're going in different directions. And, and so we're looking at different things. I, I value the mind of the Lord, and they may not. John 17 says this, I have given them thy word, and, thy, and the world hath hated them because they are not of the world, even as I'm not of the world. Second thing. Family relationships with unbelievers are important. Probably every one of us in here have, have family members that don't know Christ. Probably every one of us do. And so we're going we're to continue with those, those relationships. You, you can't cut them out of your life. They're family. Did anybody choose your family? No. no none of us chose our family. I, I didn't choose my mom and dad. They had me. I was, I was there. I didn't choose my brother. I probably... There were occasions where I wouldn't have chosen my brother, you know, but uh, uh, he probably wouldn't have chosen me. Uh, we don't get to pick our family. And unfortunately for some people, the holidays are incredibly stressful times because our lives are so different. You say, how am I going to handle this this year? How am I going to deal with this guy? How am I going to handle facing this again? And I tell you, you got to place great effort in this to maintain a strong Christian testimony in front of your family. Boy, I tell you, family knows how to needle you. Family knows where you fail. Family knows how to get under your skin. They're watching. They know where you came from. They know, they know where, you, where, where you had your lapses. They know where you, you, you stubbed your toe. They know where you messed up. And they have no qualms a lot of times about bringing that back up. You've got to stay humble. 
you got to stay grace grace filled. You got to continue to be as kind, speech seasoned with salt, and keep coming back at it. Look, I know I failed it in your in your eyes before. I know I know I've not been everything I ought to be, but I want to tell you, Christ has changed my life. And you're living your life the way you want to live it. I get it. And I'm living the way I think I ought to live my life. And so be kind. Be kind to your family. Be loving to your family. I, I, think, I think as we're, if, if you're stressed about entering into some of these family relationships that are coming up, you, you ought to bathe that in prayer just again and again. God, give me wisdom. God, give me strength. God, help me to know when to leave the family gathering when, before it gets too crazy or whatever, you know. Uh, help me to help me to deal with this uh, with with the grace of God, and so look the Lord the Lord had unbelieving siblings. No doubt they gave him grief. I have no doubt they did, but eventually they turned to the truth and believed on him, and it is a a great it is a great victory when you begin to see your loved ones come to Christ. It is worth the effort to stay to stay there and, and to, to, to make that work somehow. Close relationships, the third thing, close relationships with, with unbelievers uh, should be avo- avoided. You've got to make some, some tough choices. Uh, this verse in Proverbs 12, it says, The righteous is more excellent than his neighbor. You're not a better person. We're not better people. That's not what it's saying. We have a more excellent way, though. Our way is in Christ. It says, but the way of the wicked seduceth them. Look, you choose to company with unbelievers. You you make a a conscious choice to make friendships that are more than just friendly, and their way will seduce you. It will draw you in if you're not careful. Partnerships with the world are strong and very seductive. And uh, you're going to see... Something that you want in their life, and you go, go. I want that. I'm going to cut the corners. I'm not going to do it God's way because I want what they have, and it appeals to you. As a believer, God's not going to let you enjoy that. He has a way of troubling your soul that you're not going to enjoy the sin that they are able to enjoy. And so that's that's it's very difficult. There's a great possibility of you falling into their vices. And so uh, one of the things about choosing these close relationships. Dating the lost should be very off limits. But if someone married someone that's lost, the Bible, Scripture teaches us that we ought to, by the, by the testimony of the one that knows Christ, to win the one that's lost. So there's not, there's not like an out there. Well, he, she or he was lost and I shouldn't have married him, so I'm going to not marry him now. That's not, that's not what the Bible's teaching us. But it's teaching us to be very very careful about the partnerships, the fellowships that we enter. See, marriage, dating, uh, business relationships. Now now think about this. You're you're entering into a relationship with somebody and you both of you got a stack of cash. You say it's going to take an investment, both of us, $50,000 and $50,000. We're going to put this together. We're going to open up a business and you're saved and they're lost. You're trying to live life by the principles of God's word and they're doing it, you know, they're they're fairly moral person and they're they're kind. They're a good person. But you get in a straight, you get your back against the wall. That's tough sometimes when you you got people that don't believe the same way. They say, I'm I don't want to cheat. I don't I don't want to cut any corners. I don't want to do anything wrong. They say, we gotta cut some corners here. We gotta we can't we can't tell the truth on this deal. We're gonna have to kind of fudge the details. I don't think we ought to do that. And so you're in this relationship. It's tough. It's tough to, tough to make that match. You, you don't want to be in a position where your partner is trying to get you to lie or to cheat or to steal, to get ahead. The fourth thing, witness to sinners and walk with saints. Lead a separate life, a different kind of life, a godly life. That's essential in our world. So we're witnessing to sinners, every sinner. You, you'll never witness to the wrong sinner. <laughs> you'll never witness to the wrong person. But we're going to walk with saints. We're going to get our counsel from the saints of God. We're, we're going to have our fulfillment in our saints. And so the, we, we understand this, I think, that 
our association with the saints of God, that this is important. This is key. We, we have to have this to, for our spiritual good. And so we get to this application. Separation from the world is a conscious daily decision. The world's trying to get in in every direction today, it seems like. There's all these kinds of things trying to get in. And so we're to be friendly, but not friends with the world. We're to be in the world, but not of the world. And so here's some questions we're going to ask ourselves. Does this draw me closer to God or to, to the world? What kind of influence is this on me? Does it bother me when I see no difference between Christians in general or me? Is there any difference between me and the world? Three, do I spend more time with fellow believers or unsaved friends? Do I feel more comfortable with fellow believers or unsaved friends? Number five, are my speech, my dress, my values, my conduct, is that distinct from the world's? Or do, do I see myself sliding, bending, conforming to what it wants to make me? Trying to get me to, to, to toe the line with them. Hey, you can give a little there. You don't have to do that. You don't have to say this. You can take a little bit in and be okay. I tell you, it is, it is an amazing thing. Just looking back at my own life. It is an amazing thing that when I began to walk away from God, how that became easier and easier and easier and easier. And I found friends that didn't have the convictions that my old friends had. It made it easier. It kind of quenched that, that conviction that I was facing. And so uh, that slide, is it starts slow and it begins to creep. And then it's pretty fast at times. Sixth thing, do my unsaved friends or family notice a difference in my Christian walk? There ought to be something. There ought to be something different about us. Something. What is different about us? They say, I don't know. I don't know that I see any difference between me and the lost. You've got to work on that. Light and darkness. Light and darkness, very different, aren't they? You know, keep cutting the darkness out. Try to be around more light. Keep the light of God's word into your head and in your heart. And we ought to, we got to be a light to this world. If there's, if there's, if there's darkness in us, we're not going to be much of a light to those around us.